Arminianism is a theological stance originating from the teachings and scholarly work of Jacobus Arminius, a Dutch theologian of the late 16th century. It was formalised by his followers, known as the Remonstrants, who articulated their beliefs in opposition to the prevailing Calvinistic doctrines of their time. Central to Arminian theology is the emphasis on human free will in the salvation process, standing in stark contrast to the Calvinist doctrine of predestination and unconditional election. Arminianism posits that salvation is conditional upon faith in God, which is a choice that individuals are free to make, thus allowing for the possibility that divine grace can be resisted. This essay aims to delve into an analysis of Arminianism through the lens of Reformed theology, which provides a foundational juxtaposition characterised by doctrinal divergence. The Reformed perspective, with its importance on sovereign grace and predestined election, offers a critical framework from which to examine the Arminian prominence on human agency and conditional grace. Through this comparative analysis, the essay will explore the theological, scriptural and practical implications of Arminian beliefs as they differ with Reformed thought. The subsequent sections of this essay will cover the historical development of Arminianism, including a detailed look at the life and work of Jacobus Arminius and the pivotal Synod of Dort, which firmly rejected Arminianism and codified the five points of Calvinism in response. By examining these core tenets and their reception within the broader historical and theological context, this essay will bring a comprehensive overview of the critical interplay between Arminianism and Reformed theology, accentuating how each tradition continues to influence contemporary Christian thought and practice. Through this investigation, we aim to shed light on the intricate drapery of doctrinal positions that define and shape the discourse within Protestant Christianity. First of all, Jacobus Arminius, born in 1560 in the Netherlands, appeared as a significant theological figure against the backdrop of Reformed Orthodoxy, which was deeply rooted in the teachings of John Calvin. Arminius began his theological education at the University of Leiden before continuing his studies in Geneva under Theodore Beyser, Calvin's successor. It was during these formative years that Arminius was exposed to rigorous Calvinistic doctrine, which he initially embraced. However, his subsequent appointment as a pastor in Amsterdam, and later as a professor at the University of Leiden, saw the growth of his critical stance towards certain aspects of Calvinistic theology, particularly predestination and unconditional election. Arminius's teachings began to crystallise around the concept of free will, supposing that divine grace could be resisted and that salvation was conditional upon faith, which individuals could either accept or reject. This posture bluntly compared with the prevailing Calvinist doctrine that God's grace was irresistible and that his election was unconditional, based solely on divine choice rather than any merit or decision of the individual. Arminius argued that such views undermined the omnibenevolence and justice of God. His theological stances stirred controversy and initiated a series of debates within the Dutch Reformed Church. The growing tension between supporters of Arminianism and traditional Calvinists led to the Synod of Dort in 1618-1619, a central ecclesiastical assembly convened to address the controversies engendered by Arminius's teachings who had passed away by then, in 1609. The Synod was attended by Reformed theologians from across Europe, including representatives from England, Germany and Switzerland, reflecting the international interest and concern over the disputes. The Synod of Dort's proceedings were rigorous and marked by a strong affirmation of Calvinistic doctrine. The Assembly meticulously examined the five points of disagreement presented by the Arminians, known as the Remonstrants of 1610, which enunciated their resistance to notable Calvinistic doctrines. The Synod ultimately condemned Arminianism as heretical, reaffirming the Calvinist attitudes on total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. These doctrinal affirmations were later summarised in the Canons of Dort, which became a cornerstone of Reformed Orthodoxy.
The decision of the Synod had profound connotations for the Dutch Reformed Church and for Protestantism broadly. It not only marginalised Arminian theology within the Dutch context, but also influenced Reformed churches worldwide, cementing Calvinistic orthodoxy in many branches of Protestantism. The Synod's rulings led to the persecution of Arminians, who were expelled from public office and ecclesiastical positions, further stigmatising Arminianism within orthodox Reformed circles. Despite these condemnations, Arminianism continued to survive and evolve. In England, Arminian thought found fertile ground and began to integrate into the Anglican Church, influencing theological and ecclesiastical advancements. It later became a fundamental element of Methodism, founded by John Wesley in the 18th century. Wesley's interpretation of Arminianism affirmed salvation available to all and the role of grace in enabling human free will, thus contributing to the spread of Arminian beliefs in various evangelical movements across the globe. The historical trajectory of Arminianism, from its inception to its formal condemnation and subsequent integration into other Protestant traditions, illustrates the dynamic nature of theological dialogue within Christianity. The debates that Arminius initiated have persisted in various forms, chewing the ongoing struggle to reconcile concepts of divine sovereignty with human responsibility. This historical overview sets the stage for a greater survey of the doctrinal disputes that continue to distinguish and define the boundaries between Arminianism and Reformed theology. As such, the legacy of the Synod of Dort and its doctrinal formulations remain influential, asserting the enduring impact of these early 17th century theological confrontations on contemporary Christian thought and practice. Also, Arminianism, as expressed by Jacobus Arminius and later formalised by his followers, the Remonstrants, centres on several key doctrinal tenets that contradict sharply with Calvinistic precepts. These doctrines highlight human free will, conditional salvation, and the universality of Christ's atonement, which collectively afford a more synergistic approach to the relationship between divine grace and human response. Central to Arminian theology is the assertion that human beings possess free will in matters of faith and salvation. Unlike Calvinism, which teaches total depravity in a way that human beings are completely unable to choose God without prior regeneration, Arminianism postulates that, while humanity is indeed tainted by sin, God's provenient grace restores to every person the ability to accept or reject divine grace. This grace is thus resistible. God does not override the individual's ability to choose salvation or to refuse it. This view upholds a potent interaction between divine initiation and human response where salvation is presented as a genuine offer rather than an imposed decree. Moreover, in Arminian doctrine, election is conditional upon faith in Jesus Christ. This exists in disagreement to the unconditional election of Calvinism, where God's predestined choice is independent of any foreseen merit or decision on the part of the individual. Arminians contend that God's election is based on foreknowledge, where God predestines individuals to salvation based on his foreknowledge of who will believe in Christ. This perspective indicates God's omniscience and maintains his sovereignty, while also affirming the meaningfulness of human choice and the genuine offer of salvation to all. Furthermore, unlike the Calvinistic view of limited atonement, which presupposes that Christ died exclusively for the elect, Arminianism teaches universal atonement. According to Arminian theology, Christ's atoning sacrifice was made on behalf of all people, not just the elect. This universality maintains the doctrine that anyone can be saved, thereby aligning with the scriptural invitations that whosoever will may come and accept the free offer of the gospel. This tenet cogitates a more inclusive view of salvation and portrays God's love and mercy as impartial and universally accessible. In addition, Arminianism points out that the grace of God can be resisted and that not all who are called by God necessarily come to conversion. This idea is fundamentally different from the Calvinist doctrine of irresistible grace, which holds that all who are chosen and called by God will inevitably come to a saving faith 
without any ability to resist. Arminians hold that God, in his grace, respects the freedom he has endowed to humans and does not force his saving grace upon anyone. This aspect of Arminianism reiterates a more cooperative paradigm of salvation in which divine grace and human freedom operate together to facilitate genuine spiritual conversion and commitment. Further, Arminianism deviates from Calvinism on the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. While Calvinists believe that those who are elected and saved will persevere to the end and cannot lose their salvation, Arminians propose that salvation requires continual faith and obedience. In Arminian thought, it is possible for a believer to fall from grace through a deliberate and sustained abandonment of faith. This view places a critical attention on the need for moral responsibility and vigilance in the Christian life. These core tenets of Arminianism consider a theological foundation that is distinct in its more optimistic view of human nature, its insistence on the universality of Christ's atonement, and its insistence on the conditional aspects of election and perseverance. They typify God as lovingly and justly contributing the means of salvation universally, while respecting human agency and responsibility. This core not only challenges Calvinistic determinism, but also aligns closely with extensive scriptural narratives that call for human response to divine initiative. Through these doctrines, Arminianism displays a robust, alternative theological paradigm that has quite influenced Christian thought and practice, specifically in the context of evangelical and Methodist traditions. Besides, from a Reformed theology perspective, Arminianism presents critical theological disputes that are often viewed as undermining the sovereignty of God and the scriptural teachings about salvation. The core tenets of Arminianism, conditional election, universal atonement, resistible grace, and the potential for apostasy, are critically assessed by Reformed theologians who advocate for a doctrinal scheme grounded in God's ultimate authority and predestinative purpose. One of the primary Reformed critiques of Arminianism centres on its intensity on human free will. Reformed theologians debate that this priority compromises the sovereignty of God in the salvation process. In the Calvinist view, salvation is an act of God from beginning to end. God elects, God calls, God justifies and God glorifies. The introduction of a human ability to resist divine grace is seen as a theological error that attributes too much power to fallen humanity, and too little to the omnipotent and omniscient Creator. The Reform doctrine of total depravity posits that humans are not merely sick in sin, but dead in sin, Ephesians 2, 1, 5, and thus entirely reliant on God for their regeneration and faith. Additionally, Arminianism's stance on universal atonement is another point of contention. The Reformed analysis disputes that if Christ died for all people without exception, then the effectiveness of his atonement is diminished. Essentially, it potentially fails to save those it was intended to save if they do not choose to believe. This perspective undermines the scriptural claims of Christ's successful and definite redemption, John 10 11, 15, Hebrews 9:12. In disparity, the Reformed doctrine of limited atonement, or particular redemption, repeats that Christ's death effectively achieved salvation for those whom God had foreordained to save, ensuring that all for whom Christ died would inevitably be brought to faith through irresistible grace. Also, Arminianism's claim that divine grace can be resisted, and that salvation can be rejected, even after an initial acceptance is seen by Reformed theologians, as problematic. This view is perceived to diminish God's capacity and the transformative nature of his grace. The doctrine of irresistible grace in Reformed theology suggests that when God's grace is extended to the elect, it effectively brings about the willing response of faith. This grace is not an external pressure, but an internal renewal that infallibly leads to conversion. Thus, the idea of resistible grace is viewed as inconsistent with the biblical representation of God's invincible intention and grace, Philippians 2.13, John 6.37-44. Moreover, the Arminian posture that believers can lose their salvation if they cease to maintain faith or live obediently is fundamentally opposed by Reformed theology. 
According to Calvinism, the perseverance of the saints is not reliant on human faithfulness, but on God's unchangeable decrees and the lasting intercession of Christ for his elect. John 10, 28, 29, Romans 8, 29, 30, Hebrews 7, 25. The Reformed view promotes a profound comfort and assurance in the Christian life, grounded not in the unstable will of humans, but in the steadfast promise and strong keeping of God. The Reformed appraisal of Arminianism therefore extends across these theological dimensions, often focusing on the perceived indications of Arminian doctrines that elevate human capabilities and potentially limit divine control. For the Reformed tradition, the sovereignty of God is the theological linchpin that ensures the consistency and reliability of salvation, attributes that might be compromised under Arminian theology as it allows for human resistance and potential failure in the face of grace. This assessment not only underlines the doctrinal differences between Arminianism and Reformed theology, but also underscores the central differences in understanding God's nature, human nature, and the interaction between divine grace and human response in the economy of salvation. Furthermore, Arminianism's doctrinal tenets continue to exert a rich influence on contemporary Christian theology and practice, especially within evangelical circles and denominations that emphasise personal choice and responsibility in salvation, such as the Methodist and Pentecostal movements. This influence invites ongoing dialogue and comment, notably from Reformed theologians who view Arminian perspectives as atypical from what they consider scriptural truths about divine sovereignty and grace. The engagement between these two theological traditions accentuates both their distinct accesses to biblical interpretation and their shared involvement to doctrinal rigour. Arminian theology resonates strongly within modern Christianity, principally through its alignment with the broadly appealing concept of free will in a culture that values individualism and personal responsibility. Many contemporary churches and denominational bodies that lean towards Arminianism often affirm the universality of Christ's atonement and the opportunity for every person to choose salvation. This inclusivity is manifest in the evangelical call to accept Jesus as a personal act of faith, mellow with the Arminian gravity on human agency. Furthermore, Arminianism's influence is notable in theological education and seminary training, where these debates inform and sometimes polarise student and faculty interpretations of Christian doctrine. In addition, Arminianism advances to a theological diversity that can be seen as enriching to the global church, extending a counterpoint to Calvinistic determinism and promoting a version of Christianity that is vibrant and interconnecting in its outreach. However, this variety also poses difficulties in terms of maintaining doctrinal unity and coherence within denominations that house both Calvinist and Arminian sympathisers. The persistence of this difference calls for ongoing theological dialogue to focus on potential misunderstandings and to bridge doctrinal divides, especially in the ecumenical context. Further, Recent years have seen a resurgence in scholarly dialogue between Arminian and Reformed theologians, aided by conferences, symposia and publications that seek to analyse these traditions' doctrinal bases. Scholars from both sides join in these interactions not only to defend their respective views, but also to clarify common misconceptions about their doctrines. For instance, Contemporary Reformed scholars often focus on nuanced comprehensions of God's sovereignty that do not essentially negate human responsibility, while Arminian scholars underscore aspects of God's foreknowledge and provenient grace in ways that seek compatibility with divine sovereignty. Despite their differences, there is a concerted effort among some theologians to utter a shared grasp that respects both traditions' insights while addressing the inclusive needs of the Church. This ecumenical way is evident in joint declarations and statements of faith that emphasise agreement on core Christian doctrines while acknowledging diversification in those areas where differences persist. These efforts are crucial in a global religious landscape where the perception of Christianity as doctrinally fractured can hinder its public witness. Besides, on a practical level, 
the dialogues between Arminian and Reformed traditions have big meanings for preaching, pastoral care, and missions. For instance, Arminian-leaning congregations might accentuate decision-oriented evangelism strategies, which invite individuals to make a personal decision to follow Christ, a method that can be exceptionally effective in individualistic cultures. Conversely, Reformed congregations might focus on the assurance of God's sovereign choice, which can equip strong comfort and stability for believers navigating the uncertainties of life. Additionally, theological seminaries play a climactic role in shaping the next generation of church leaders' intuitiveness of Arminian and Reformed theology. These institutions are often the battlegrounds for these doctrinal debates, with curriculum choices and faculty appointments contemplating expansive denominational and theological orientations. The way these doctrines are taught can seriously influence how emerging church leaders preach, teach and minister to their congregations. In summary, the contemporary consequence of Arminianism and its dialogue with Reformed theology demonstrates both the vitality and the complexity of these doctrinal traditions within modern Christianity. As the church moves forward, the need for thoughtful, respectful and constructive theological dialogue remains central. Such contacts not only help clarify the doctrines themselves, but also serve to unify the Church, enhancing its mission and ministry in an increasingly complicated and pluralistic world. In conclusion, the examination of Arminianism through the lens of Reformed theology affirms a potent and ongoing theological dialogue that shapes the contours of Protestant Christian thought. This comparative analysis reveals constitutional differences in figuring out divine sovereignty, human free will, the nature of salvation, and the efficacy of Christ's atonement. Arminianism, with its strength on conditional election and universal atonement, gives a perspective that asserts human agency and the universal scope of God's redemptive plan. In distinction, Reformed theology insists on God's unconditional election and sovereign grace, highlighting the certainty and particularity of salvation for the elect. Also, the historical curve from the teachings of Jacobus Arminius through the Synod of Dort to contemporary theological debates exemplifies the abiding impact of these doctrinal discussions. These debates are not bare theological abstractions, but have practical overtones for church life, pastoral care, evangelism, and the personal faith experiences of believers. The persistence of Arminianism within various Christian denominations and movements attests to its appeal and theological vitality, confronting Calvinistic norms and broadening the Christian doctrinal mural. Moreover, as this dialogue continues into the modern era, it is compelling for both Arminian and Reformed communities to lock in respectful and constructive discussions. Such commitments not only aggravate mutual perception, but also promote a far-reaching ecumenical spirit that can bridge doctrinal divides. Ultimately, the goal of these discussions should be to foster a broader grasp of biblical truths and to enhance the unity and witness of the Church in a various and divided world. Lastly, this analysis not only pronounces the distinctions between Arminianism and Reformed theology, but also indicates the need of ongoing theological thought. In crossing these convoluted doctrinal waters, the Church is better equipped to proclaim the Gospel faithfully and effectively in the contemporary world, ensuring that its teachings are both biblically grounded and contextually relevant.